point. What companies can do is connect in lots of different ways. Microsoft is doing something wonderful. They're actually vowing to retrain two million Americans with IT training, using their existing infrastructure to do something good. Also, a really interesting company is Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex is all about personal accountability of their management and their employees, to the point where they really kind of shun the idea of bosses, but they also talk about the fact that their executives, all of their expense reports, are put onto their company intranet for everyone to see. Complete transparency. <laughs> Think twice before you have that bottle of wine. <laughs> the third of the four laws of post-crisis consumerism is about durable living. We're seeing in our data that consumers are realizing this is a marathon, not a sprint. They're digging in and they're looking for ways to extract value out of every purchase that they make. Witness to the fact that Americans are holding onto their cars longer than ever before. 9.4 years on average in March, a record. We also see the fact that libraries have become a huge resource for America. Did you know that 68% of Americans now carry a library card? The highest percentage ever in our nation's history. So what you see in this trend is also the accumulation of knowledge. Continuing education is up. Everything is focused on betterment and training and development and moving forward. We also see a big DYI movement. I was fascinated to learn that 30% of all households in America, or homes rather, are actually built by owners. That includes cottages and the like, but 30%. So people are getting their hands dirty. They're rolling up their sleeves. They want these skills. We see that with the phenomenon of raising backyard hens and chickens and ducks. And when you work out the math, they say it doesn't work. But the principle is there that it's about being sustainable and taking care of yourself. And then we look at the High Line in New York City, an excellent use of reimagining existing infrastructure for something good, which is a brand new park in, in New York City. So what brands can do and companies is pay dividends to consumers, be a brand that lasts, offer transparency, promise you're going to be there beyond today's sale. Perfect example of that is Patagonia. Patagonia's Footprint Chronicles basically goes through and tracks every product that they make and gives you social responsibility and helps you understand the ethics that are behind the product that they make. Another great example is Fidelity. Rather than instant cashback rewards on your credit or debit purchases, this is about 529 rewards for your student education. Or the interesting company Sunrun. I love this company. They've created a consumer collective where they put um, solar panels on households and create a consumer-based utility where the consumer's um, electricity that they generate is basically pumped back out into the marketplace. So a consumer-driven co-op. So the fourth sort of post-crisis consumerism that we see is this movement about return to the fold. It's incredibly important right now. Trust is not parceled out, as we all know. It's now about connecting to your communities, connecting to your social networks. In my book, I talked about the fact that 72% of people trust what other people say about a brand or a company versus 15% on advertising. So in that respect, cooperative consumerism has really taken off. This is about consumers working together to get what they want out of the marketplace. Let's look at a couple of quick examples. The artisanal movement is huge. Everything about locally derived products and services supporting your local neighborhoods, whether it's cheeses, wines, and, and other products. Also this rise of local currencies. Realizing that it's difficult to get loans in this environment, you're doing business with people you trust in your local markets. So this rise of this sort of local currency is another really interesting phenomenon. And then they did a recent report I thought was fascinating. They actually started in certain communities in the United States start to publish people's electricity usage. And what they found out is when that was available for public record, the people's electricity usage in those communities dropped. <laughs> then we also look at the idea of cowpooling, which is the whole phenomenon of consumers organizing together to buy meat from organic farms that they know is safe and controlled in the way that they want it to be controlled. And then there's this other really interesting movement that's happened in California, which is about carrot mobs. The traditional thing would be to boycott, right? Have a stick? Well, why not have a carrot? So these are consumers organizing, pooling their resources to incentivize companies to do good. And then we look at what companies can do then. This is all the opportunity about being a community organizer. You have to realize that you can't fight and control this. You actually need to organize it, you need to harness it, you need to give it meaning. And there's lots of really interesting examples here that we see. First is just the rise of the fact that Zagat's has actually moved out of and diversified from rating restaurants into actually rating healthcare. So what credentials does Zagat's have? Well, they have a lot because it's their network of people, right? And so that becomes a very powerful force for them 
to make their brand more elastic. Then you look at the phenomenon of Koji. This Koji doesn't exist. It's a moving truck, right? It's a moving truck through LA, and the only way you can find it is through Twitter. Or you look at, or you look at Johnson & Johnson's Momversations, right? A phenomenal blog that's been built up where J&J &J basically is tapping into the power of mommy bloggers, allowing them to basically create a forum where they can communicate and they can connect. And it's also become a very, very valuable sort of advertising revenue for J&J &J as well. This plus the fact that you've got phenomenal work from CEOs, from Ford to Zappos, connecting on Twitter, creating an open environment, allowing their employees to be part of the process rather than hidden behind walls. You see this rising force in sort of total transparency and openness that companies are starting to adopt, all because the consumer is demanding it. So when we look at this and we step back, what I believe is that the crisis that exists today is definitely real. It's been tremendously powerful for consumers. But at the same time, this is also a tremendous opportunity. And the Chinese character for crisis is actually the same side of the same coin. Crisis equals opportunity. What we're seeing with consumers right now is the ability for them to actually lead us forward out of this recession. So we believe that values-driven spending will force capitalism to be better, it will drive innovation, it will make longer lasting products, it will create better, more intuitive customer service, and it will give us the opportunity to connect with companies that share the values that we share. So when we look back and step out at this and, and see the beginning of these trends that we're seeing in our data, we see a very hopeful picture for the future of America. Thank you very much.